How do we handle forgiveness with repeat offenders? You got your Bible there? Uh, let's turn to Luke chapter 17 again, our well-worn passage for the day. And what's interesting is, um, like so many things in, in the Christian life, guys, that there's a balance here. You know, Jesus says in verse 4, if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. And I think there's a part of us that says, well, if he comes back six other times in the same day, confessing by implication the same thing, we would call his repentance into question, wouldn't we? The same day, the same thing, seven times? And Jesus says what? Seven times, what does he say we should do? Forgive Forgive him. So, so here's one principle. We ought to expect that in an imperfect world with progressive sanctification, meaning you know, we're, we're growing as we go, that repentance will be the normal, ordinary process of relationships with other Christians. I think sometimes that when people come in repentance, we're like, Oh, something horrible just happened. When, it, when actually, you know, what Luther said is true, right? Repentance ought to be the normal process of the Christian life. So, on the one hand, Jesus is saying we need to have a category for a person in need of repentance multiple times who comes repenting, asking for forgiveness multiple times, and we need to have a heart that's ready to forgive that and not necessarily see that as a counterfeit repentance, okay? So, that, that's one point. On the other hand, we recognize at the same time that just because somebody says they repent doesn't necessarily mean that they are repenting. And notice what Jesus says. He says if if he comes back, you know, saying he's repenting, right, in the previous verse, if he repents, forgive him. So the implication of what Jesus is saying here is that there is some legitimacy to his repentance, right? There's, there's legitimacy to that. We also need to have a category, if you're in Luke, back up to Matthew chapter 3. So that's one principle. Let, let's talk about the balance of that, right? The balance of that is we also need to have a category that says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, <laughs> will enter the kingdom of God. Meaning, people can say all they want. People can say, I'm sorry. People can say, I confess. People can say, I repent. And those words don't represent actual true repentance, okay? So here's the other principle. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 3. Matthew is introducing us to the ministry of John the Baptist here prior to j- the start of Jesus' ministry. And, and you know the story, right? He's, um, he, he's baptizing with water. He's declaring the, the way of the Lord that that's coming. And in, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, some of the Pharisees were coming out to the river to marvel at the man wearing camel's hair and eating a weird diet of honey and bugs. And uh, so he's coming here. John sees the Pharisees, and he says, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, I'm so glad you're, no, that's not what he said. He said, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, why would he say that? He says that because there is some reason that John knows that calls into question the motive of the Pharisees and why they are there. And of course, the narrator tells us they're there just because they're intrigued by this weird guy that lives out in the desert and has a weird clothing and eats a weird diet, right? So, John says it is right to demonstrate repentance to show that it's real. So, what do we do with forgiveness with repeat offenders? the two principles. We ought to expect that regular repentance is normal. Being willing to forgive multiple times is what Jesus tells us, but we also need to have another category that says sometimes people are faking repentance. Sometimes they're just talking and they're not truly repenting, and wisdom would say sometimes we might need to wait and watch for fruits of repentance, especially when there's been a track record of a lack of repentance. Now, I'm going to say this, and you tell me if I'm wrong. There's a difference between false repentance and true repentance that happens multiple times for the same thing. I don't know about you, I repent over a lot of the same things lots of times, and I hope that that repentance is genuine and real. The fact I have to do it multiple times doesn't necessarily call into question the genuineness of my repentance. It demonstrates the fact that I'm being progressively sanctified like you, but that's different than someone who's not actually repenting. And that's the difference. So, I mean, there's, I think, a lot of ways that you could approach thinking through 
and developing the point because I think sometimes when people say, how do I handle repeat offenses, sometimes they're talking about the difficulty of being able to forgive. And I think that's, you know, going back to Luke 17, that's to some degree what um, the responses from the disciples, they say to the Lord, increase our faith. I think that they're saying it's hard, it's difficult. How is it possible that we can really do this? Uh, maybe in some sense it's easy to, to do it once, maybe up to seven times, but to continually forgive on a repeated ongoing day-to-day -day basis, someone who is sinning against us uh, takes something I think the uh, disciples were saying is, is more than what we have inside of us, okay, to some degree. And what the, the Lord ultimately says in response to that is it's not about your faith that's, that's lacking. He said, if you had the faith of a mustard seed, okay, you could say to this mulberry tree, you know, be uprooted. And so there's, there's all kinds of things that they could do. They, they had faith. That wasn't the issue. Ultimately, it was a deficiency in humility, uh, particularly. And so they look at Jesus calls them to obey and to follow in obedience the things that he's ultimately called them to do. And so he says, so you too, in verse 10, when you do all the things which you are, comma what are commanded you, say, we are unworthy slaves, we have done only that's what which we ought to have done. And I, I think as you look at the difficulty of forgiveness, I, I think it can be one sin too, it doesn't have to be 490 or whatever the math is on, on that 70 times 7. It, it comes to obedience in response to the Lord and not so much something that we don't have inside of ourselves, it's our willingness to obey the Lord. And as we look at it, it certainly is difficult, but a, a passage like 1 Peter 5, 5 comes to mind, or maybe even Hebrews, uh, what is it, 4, 14 to 16, where we're to approach the throne of grace to find help, to find grace, okay, to help us in a time of need. And so as we come, you know, um, up to repeat offenses, it is, it is not so much, and sometimes, at least in terms of our own response, the problem is not the repeat offense. The problem is the difficulty of responding to that repeat offense in our, from, our, from our own perspective in a way that continues to honor the Lord and love people well. And that's what really should burden our heart the most is honoring the Lord and loving the other person in response to that, most definitely. Yeah. I think Keith, what he said, you know, was well, and I think beyond that is, well, what about the repeat offenses? Well, that might demonstrate that there isn't genuine repentance as well, too. And so that's where Matthew 18, you know, may come into play. And that's where, just like he recommended earlier with complicated situations, you get other people involved. Many times your pastors, an elder, something like that, where they can then help you discern and to think through the next steps to be able to not only respond well yourself, which many times we need help with that, but also to loving that other person well and thinking through the different processes that you might need to go to yeah. to really help restore and encourage them particularly. Yeah.